Yeah, absolutely. We had over 250 volunteers serving in Owensboro uh, last weekend. And so we thank you for partnering with us and allowing us to partner with other churches in our community to do kingdom work. It was an incredible weekend and we look forward to more in the future. And I want to welcome you to Owensboro Christian Church. My name is Kurt Jordan. I'm the middle school pastor here at OCC. And if you have your Bible or your Bible app, let me invite you to open it up to Philippians chapter two. We're going to be continuing in our series. Be sure of this. And as you're turning there, I want you to think of a time in your life when you've been humbled, when you've been served a big old slice of humble pie, right? the worst tasting pie in the world. It never tastes good to get humbled. I can think of a few times in my life, um, one of them being when I was in elementary school. I moved to a new school from my tiny, tiny school in Collins, Mississippi. You couldn't even find it on a map if you tried. We had one stoplight. And we had a small little elementary school that I like had all the awards at. I was like the number one reader Uh, It was pretty awesome. I felt pretty good about myself. And then I moved to my school in Jackson, Mississippi, which was a little bit larger, over 2,000 students. And uh, turns out I was just a big fish in a little pond. And also they were already doing the letters with the numbers. Um, Why do we do that? That seems seems wrong. Seems like, okay, you guys love algebra. Good for y'all. Or maybe you're like me and whenever you went on your honeymoon, you went to see the ocean. I saw the Pacific Ocean for the first time and I looked out over it and the vastness just overwhelmed me. It reminded me how small I really was. Or maybe you started your career like I started mine when I was 18 or 19 years old in ministry and you thought you knew everything and then you get about mm, five minutes in and you're like, I know nothing. I know nothing at all. It's a really humbling experience, but there's no more humbling experience than church league softball. In my life, there has been no more humbling experience than church league softball. And a lot of you out there are judging right now. You're saying softball. Do they do the fast pitch? Mm -mm. It's all the slow pitch. And you're like, well, I would hit nothing but home runs. Oh, I bet you would. It's what you think. I thought I was going to be pretty good at it. I'm fairly athletic. I pick up physical activities fairly quickly. I played soccer my whole life, and I was like, I can play softball. I did forget about the conversation in the car when I was in third grade where my dad was like, hey, buddy, glad you tried baseball. Maybe it's time to pick a new sport. But forgetting that, I blanked that part of my memory out, and I decided to play church league softball, and I love it for the social aspect. But um, it's hard and I'm not good at fielding. Like they put me in right field, which is where you hide your bad players. Usually if you play right field, by the way, and you just found that out, like, sorry. And I was so bad at right field, like the ball would hit behind me or 50 feet in front of me. It was embarrassing to watch. They were like, let's put him at catcher. Now, I don't know if you know anything about slow pitch softball, but catcher is like an unnecessary position. It is not necessary They're like taught, like the ump could just like kick it back to the pitcher. It'd be fine. And then I was so bad at that, that they moved me to substitute catcher. So I was substituting for the only position that doesn't do anything in slow pitch softball. Um, And so it was a really humbling experience. It was, I know what you're thinking. Well, Kurt, at least you could bat. Don't even get started on that. I struck out anyway. Uh, So in slow pitch, I struck out. We could talk about it all day. But we can all laugh at my foolishness and my arrogance to think how great I was going to be at something that I'd never done before, especially if you love baseball or you've played softball or whatever for a long time. You might be laughing at me, but we've all experienced a moment in our life where our pride was shattered. And that always happens when we walk in pride, when we walk in self-importance or haughtiness, there will always be a moment where we're humbled. And often this humbling is an experience that's painful or embarrassing or even just plain inconvenient. And because of this, the word humility can leave a bad taste in our mouths because we associate it with painful experiences of our pride being broken down. We start to have a psychological aversion to the word humble, to being humble when the truth is humility in and of itself is not painful. 
Again, the breaking down of our pride, that's painful. The moment where it feels like the rug is yanked out from under you, that can be painful. But humility, humility is comforting. Humility is freeing. It's something we should strive for. Humility frees us of the need to impress others with our own accomplishments. Humility frees us from the need to be in control because it allows us to step back and realize how big God is and that he's in control, that he has a plan for us. And humility is how we have beneficial, mature, and healthy relationships with people around us. And humility is what we're talking about today. I'm going to invite you to stand as we read from Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to invite you to stand out of respect for the word of God. We're going to read verses 1 through 11. Starting in verse 1, it says, If then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. Adopt the same attitude as Christ Jesus who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Maybe your version even says grasped. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And for this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him a name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the father. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Paul begins this chapter by saying, if then, and what he's doing is actually continuing his train of thought from the previous chapter. And it's important to remember that this was a letter before it was a book of the Bible. This is a letter written by Paul to the church in Philippi. And so when we read it, we have to remember it wasn't originally broken up into different chapters. So sometimes, even as we swap to a new chapter, we're going to be continuing along with the same thought. And the thought that we're continuing is how the church is to deal with conflict or struggle. In the end of chapter one, Paul is specifically pointing out how the church is to deal with external struggles. And our lead pastor, Scott, talked about that last week by describing these struggles as interruptions in our life. But even in the midst of those struggles, even in the midst of the hardest circumstance in your life, God is still doing amazing things. Even while Paul was in prison writing this letter, God was working through him. And then... To begin chapter two, Paul switches from speaking on the external struggles of the church, of the things that are happening outside, to the internal struggles, the internal conflicts that arise among believers. And while Paul, later in chapter four, calls out two specific people when he addresses conflict in the church, he, he calls out two women who were in conflict with one another. Throughout this entire book, he never specifically says what the conflict actually is. And I think that's important for us to note because it doesn't matter what the conflict is, whether it's a disagreement or someone feels as though they've been slighted in some way, even small conflicts, small little disagreements between believers can lead to really big issues. And anyone who's ever been married knows this to be true. When me and Brooke, my wife, first got married, 
Uh, the small conflicts, the small little ones that cause you to bristle, the little quirks that you thought were so cute when we were dating and you joked about are the ones that seem to blow up into the biggest like screaming matches. And again, we're loud people. So I understand that a lot of that could just be personality, but it seemed like the small ones were the one that caused the biggest problems. And for example, I'm a night owl. I love staying up late. I stay up late every night because it's me time. And I did this before we even were dating. I would stay up late and I would play video games or I would play guitar or I would read or I would catch up on TV shows. This was my time to decompress. And I then would make that time up by sleeping late in the morning. And some of you out here are judgmental because I slept till 12 yesterday. And you're like sitting there, you're like, you wait till you have kids. Well, I don't. So ha ha ha. Stop judging me. I can sleep till 12. And just because you can't doesn't mean that I'm bad for it. Okay. I make up that time at night. Now, Brooke, on the other hand, goes to sleep at like 4 p.m., okay? She's like, mm, that dinner sure was good. Time to get in the bed. Like, she has no concept of staying up late and doesn't want to stay up late. And at the beginning of our marriage, it was really important for her for us to go to bed at the same time and to watch the sunset together, apparently. And so... We would go get in bed or whatever, and I would always be frustrated, and we would turn into this argument, and what would start small with like, no, I don't really want to go to bed right now would be, why don't you love me? Like, it escalated so fast, and then it would spill out from there into when we were with friends, we would be joking or something, and like that little joke made by me probably would, you know, pinprick or we would be frustrated. These small conflicts created bigger problems. And it's the same way within the church that small conflicts or even in especially larger conflicts can spill out and they can begin affecting every single part of the body, leaving us frustrated and stalled out. Which is why Paul gives some practical advice for dealing with one another within the church and even with dealing with other people in general. And he starts this practical advice by asking a series of rhetorical questions, questions that he already knows the answer to. And in verse one and two, we could even replace the if with since. He says, since there is encouragement in Christ, since there is consolation, the comfort of Christ's love, since there is fellowship of the spirit, and since there is affection and mercy. Paul is pointing out what we have in common as believers. All of us believers have the encouragement of Christ in our daily lives. Every one of us believers have his consolation of love. We all have the same spirit living within us, and we've all been offered his affection and mercy. So then, instead of fighting one another based on our differences and disagreements, Paul encourages us to seek healthy resolution based on what we have in common. And what we have in common, our commonality, is Christ. And Paul even goes so far as to say that his joy would be complete if believers would begin walking in unity together. And this unity is described as thinking the same way, having the same love, doing nothing out of selfishness and spending more time thinking of others than we think of ourselves. And I want to take a moment here because the part of this verse that we can get hung up on is the one that says thinking the same way. Now, Paul understands people. He's been around people. He's spent a lot of time leading and ministering to People. He's not naive enough to think that thinking the same way means that we have to agree on every single thing down to the little detail. Whether you like pineapple on pizza or not, whether you prefer this Netflix show to this Netflix show, whether you like Kentucky or Louisville, whatever it is, we don't have to agree on the little details. Details. The same way of thinking that Paul encourages us to have is to put aside our differences, 
to put aside our disagreements and to think together on the love that Christ has for us. And what this means in our relationships is that every hill is not a hill worth dying on. Sometimes we let go of our opinions and ideas in the name of unity because ultimately it's not about us. It's about the gospel being preached. It's about unity within the family of Christ. And it doesn't mean your opinions aren't valuable, but it does mean that our opinions or ideas, they're not more valuable than the hope that Jesus offers. And they never will be. And if those opinions or ideas are getting in the way of us advancing the gospel by creating petty conflicts, then we toss them aside. We toss them aside. And this idea of humility, which Paul brings up in verses three and four, immediately is followed by his pointing to Jesus as the example of humility that leads to unity. And verse five says this, adopt the same attitude as Christ. Maybe when you were growing up, or maybe some of you have children that you have said, you need an attitude adjustment. Paul is saying that to us right now. We need an attitude adjustment. And we need to adjust our attitude to one like Christ, because he's the ultimate example of this humility that leads to unity. And when we think of Christ as the example, when we think of adopting the same attitude of Christ, it can seem like an impossible task. And truth be told, on our own, it is. Of our own strength, of our own sheer will, we cannot adopt the same attitude as Christ because within us there is a sin nature. There's a sin nature that wants us to be selfish, that wants us to be self-important, that wants us to be prideful. Our sin nature cares more about us being right than it does us being unified. And so on our own, we cannot adopt the same attitude as Christ. However, in verse one, Paul reminds us that we have the Holy Spirit within us. We have the same spirit that was within Christ, the power of God on and in our lives. The same spirit that rose Christ from the dead lives in me and you. And because of this spirit, we can walk into a process of sanctification, of the breaking down of our sin as we grow and mature in our faith to look more like Christ in our mindset, and in our attitude to people around us. And as we dive into the rest of this text, I want us to look at three marks of Christ-like humility that we should strive for in our lives and in our relationships with others. And the first of which is submission. This word submission in Philippians 2.6, it says this, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. When I hear the word submission, my brain immediately takes me back to when I was eight years old and I was waking up on a Saturday morning at seven o'clock because my father had come into my room and yanked the covers off my bed and flipped on a light switch and started singing. Uh, it wasn't my birthday. My dad sang to wake us up because he's kind of a psychopath. Um, I love him. But he wakes up at like 4 a.m. And then on Saturday mornings, he would come in at 7 to wake me up to help mow the yard. When I was 8 years old, he was decided that it was time for me to start pulling my weight around the house. And so he came in and he would sing his song. And the song would go something about what you did the day before or just general things about who you are. He'd be like, wake up, my sweet little freckle face, brown haired boy who plays soccer. You're like, stop. <laughs> No one wants to wake up to that, and I love him, and I do miss waking up to that nowadays. But he would force me to go out and do it, and I say force because I would fight tooth and nail about it all week. I'd be like, Mom, Mom, please don't make me. Dad, please don't make me wake up and go. I would look for friends' houses to stay at. He would just make me do it in the afternoon. 
And in Mississippi, it was no joke cutting grass. And, and I didn't like doing it. And it was a really begrudging, forced thing. But I would submit to his authority. And I want to take a second because this is how we can imagine submission to be. When we think of the word submission, we imagine it as a forced position, one that is oppressive in nature. And maybe in your life, you've experienced this unhealthy version of submission that is called abuse, verbal or physical, and you have hard feelings when you hear that word. However, today we're going to be focusing on what the healthy submission to God looks like. We look to Christ as the ultimate example of submission because healthy submission is trusting and yielding to an authority that has your best interests at heart. You see, Jesus was God. He was with God in the beginning. He was equal with God. He was there when the universe was spoken into being. He was there when the universe and the light was spoken into being. He was there when God split the Red Sea. He was there when the mountains bowed, when the oceans were made. Jesus was God. He had angels worshiping his throne in heaven, and yet... He chose to step out of heaven, to take on human flesh, and to experience all the pain that comes with being human. He experienced grief. He experienced emotions. He experienced physical pain, and he did this willingly. Jesus was not forced out of heaven. He was not forced to submit like a child who's forced to do yard work even when they don't want to. It was a willful submission to his father's will in the name of an ultimate goal, to save you and me from our sins. More importantly, to allow us to have a relationship with our creator. So then, if this is the example of healthy submission, if Jesus is our example, then how do we live that out in our lives? How do we exemplify this mark of humility? And we do it through simple obedience. We exemplify submission through obedience. And what I mean by this is that submission to the will of God is a daily choice for his will to be done in your life. But even more than that, for his will to be done in this moment, when you wake up in the morning, do you submit to your own will of wanting to sleep just a couple more minutes or of wanting to scroll social media to start your day? Or do you submit to the will of God to spend time with him, to spend time in his word and pray if you choose to do that in the morning? When you're in a bad mood or you're having a bad day or something goes wrong in your day that sours the whole thing, do you submit that bad mood to God? Or do you submit to your own will and take it out on those around you instead of saying, God, I'm submitting to your will to continue to love others even when I don't feel like it. And Jesus reminds us of this in verse 38 of John chapter six, when he says, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of my father. Even Jesus submitted to the father's Will And the truth is submission is uncomfortable because it means taking our wants and displacing them for the wants of the father. But as uncomfortable as this can be, it can also be really, really simple. It's like a diet. If you think of a diet or changing your eating habits, if you start thinking of that and you're saying, I want to do this, and then you start imagining it in the scheme of a year that you say, I'm going to set the goal to eat a healthy meal every single meal of the year, and I'm never going to make a mistake. And some of you are disciplined enough to do that. Yeah, it's awesome for you. But if you're anything like me, you get to lunch after this service, and all of a sudden that cheesecake starts looking extra good. And you're like, well, I'll start on Monday because it makes more sense, like, you know, day by day. 
And then you eat it and you feel like you failed because you've already ruined your whole goal. But if you change your mindset to say, hey, I'm going to focus on making the next healthy choice. Then if you fail at lunch today, you still have an opportunity to make the next healthy choice at dinner. Submission is the same way. What is God's will for this moment? If you're at work, what is God's will for this moment? What is my opportunity here in the workplace? Should I eat lunch alone and submit to my will to sit in my car and eat by myself or, or eat in my office or work through lunch? Or do I submit to God's will to go and speak to a coworker who I know is struggling? Or to go and talk to a coworker who I've never met before? And the truth is that much like a diet, you will eventually fail. But when we're focusing on the next opportunity to obey God, our failure doesn't cripple us. Our failure spurs us forward to the next opportunity. And when we start submitting to the will of God in humility, it leads us to our next opportunity mark of humility, which is service. Submission leads us to service. In Philippians 2, 7, it says, instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant. Jesus became a servant. This sentence is one that should absolutely blow our mind because the King of Kings, the name above all names, set aside his place in heaven to step down, take on human flesh to serve those who would discredit him, to serve those who would turn their back on him, to serve those who would crucify him. Jesus was a servant. And when we walk in humility, we walk in servanthood. And I know when I say serve in the context of a Sunday morning, it can often make you immediately jump into your brain of thinking about serving within the church. And while I would encourage every single person here to jump in and find a place within the body of Christ to serve, whether it be in students, our reach, our missions, whatever it looks like for you, the servitude and the servanthood I'm talking about here is a lifestyle of service. If the totality of our service is wrapped up in one hour on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night or even a week-long mission trip, then we are missing what humility truly means. Jesus' entire life on earth was spent as a servant. Every single moment he was seeking to serve others. And he did this through his attitude and his mindset. C.S. Lewis, a writer wrote about humility and servanthood and said, humility, we could even say servanthood, is not thinking less of yourself. It's not saying, I'm awful, I'm terrible. Humility is thinking of yourself less. To focus on others more. To worry about others' needs before you worry about your own. And let me be clear, there's a time where we may have to focus on ourselves, There's a time where we may need to slow down and rest and self-care and take a break. But this is the exception, not the rule. And in our culture, that seemingly is always telling us to just focus on you, gain more money for yourself, gain more popularity for yourself, gain more muscles so you look better for yourself. Gain more whatever, but do it for you because nobody else really matters. They don't care about you and you shouldn't care about them. And the attitude of Christ is the exact opposite because it says, no, I value others more than myself because God values them. How often do you spend thinking of other people? How often do you spend praying for other people? When I say praying for other people, I mean genuinely praying for their well-being. How often 
Are you serving other people? Maybe for you that does look like serving in the church or serving in the community or doing something like serve the borough. Or maybe it looks completely different, but these are questions that we ask to see if we're exhibiting that mark of humility. And when we start walking in humility, in that servanthood, we begin exhibiting the final mark of the humble attitude of Christ, and that is sacrifice. Philippians 2.8 says this, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Christ's ultimate act of humility, his ultimate act of submission and service was his sacrifice on the cross. Christ's willingness to pay the ultimate price for us, for sinners, shows us what humility truly is. It's a laying down of one's life. And in our relationship with Christ, our daily personal spiritual relationship, that looks like living out Galatians 2.20. For I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives through me. It is sacrificing our lives that Christ may work through us. And sacrifice in our relationships with others, it may mean sacrificing something valuable to us. And it's not really sacrifice if it's not valuable. If we don't lose anything, it's not a picture of sacrifice. And so maybe for you, that valuable thing that the Lord is calling you to sacrifice is money. Maybe in your life, your act of humility is to begin actively giving back from what the Lord has blessed you with. Maybe it's committing to tithe for the first time or going beyond a tithe. Or maybe it's giving to an organization that you believe in, or it could be any number of ways. But maybe that's the way the Lord's calling you to exhibit that mark of sacrifice. Or maybe, maybe you need to sacrifice your time because time is valuable. Maybe now is the time to start sacrificing your time to pour into people around you or even to serve in the church on a weekly basis or maybe to disciple someone. Whatever it looks like, maybe it's time or maybe you need to sacrifice your opinions. Opinions are valuable. We form them and they they become kind of part of us. We hold them really close to our chest. And so this one may be really difficult for some of us. But if our opinions, our ideas about how things should be done are getting in the way of loving people, of seeing someone as someone we want to serve, then they need to be sacrificed. If our political opinions are stopping us from loving or serving others because we can't see them as someone worthy of serving based on their disagreement with us, we need to sacrifice it. It needs to go. If our sports opinions or our opinions on whatever it is is stopping us from loving or seeing someone as worthy of serving and love, it needs to be sacrificed. We sometimes have to sacrifice something valuable if we're to live out the example of Christ. If we're to submit to the Father's will, if we're to serve others and walk in humble unity with those around us, then we may have to sacrifice some of those valuable things. But this submission, service, and sacrifice in the name of humility, it's not without reward. Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says this, for this reason, God highly exalted him 
and gave him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the father with Christ as our example. We see that humility when we willingly bring ourselves low, the father exalts us. God opposes the proud, but lifts up the humble. He blesses humility. He blesses with love, with his comfort, with his peace. He blesses our relationships with others by bringing unity and the same intent. And ultimately, our reward is that God's name has brought glory through our lives. And one day, when we're all together in heaven, will stand before the throne and our creator in perfect communion and relationship with us will look at us and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Would you pray with me? Father, we come before you, God, thankful. Lord, humility is an opportunity. Lord, humility is not an obligation or something that's forced upon us. God, it's an opportunity, Lord, to value others more than we value ourselves, to listen to others more than we listen to our own thoughts, Lord, to focus on the same people that you came to pay the price for, people like myself. Lord, I pray in this time as we respond to your word, God, that you would move our hearts. Lord, shine your flashlight and show us the parts of us that maybe we need to sacrifice, that maybe we need to come to this altar and lay down. Lord, show us how to respond in this time, Lord, and we thank you for your son and his humility and his example. Lord, we love you. We believe that you are good. We pray that you would move in this place now. In your name I pray, amen.